All right, thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome again to our final guidebook webinars, uh, the Condition Assessment Calculation and Performance Restriction Calculation Guidebooks. Just a reminder that all audio is over your computer speakers. If you're having any difficulty, please take a look at the audio help file in the upper left-hand download pod. Also, you will find there are two other documents. Uh, today's webinar can be downloaded there, and also information on our brand new online TAM performance measure and target setting course. There will be more information about this course as we go through the presentation today, as well as if you have signed up for Gov Delivery, you may have a notice in your inbox when you finish uh, this webinar this afternoon that gives you more information about that free online course. For those of you um, are mostly familiar with the Adobe Connect setup, but just in case, I'd like to give a really quick logistical overview on the left-hand side of your screen. In the bottom corner is our chat pod. Please feel free to enter questions throughout the presentation and we will get to them at the end of the presentation as time permits. At the lower part of your central part of your screen is the caption pod. So if you are having difficulty hearing, you can uh, read along with our presentation um, in the caption pod at the bottom of your screen. And then of course the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Your presenters today are myself, Michidoni Smith, and Marie Resnick, who is our Region 3 Transit Asset Management Point of Contact, and Maggie Schilling, who is the NTD Program Manager. So we have three different uh, topics that we're going to talk about this afternoon, and uh, at the end we'll have question and answer. First. Uh, we're going to go over the purpose of the webinar and some of the basic NTD data requirements. And then we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about the final guidebooks for infrastructure and facilities, uh, respectively. So let's talk about the webinar purpose. So we're going to walk through the final guidebooks for the facility performance measure reporting and infrastructure performance measure reporting making sure to highlight changes from the draft to the final versions that were published in the Federal Register. Oh, this slide doesn't look so great. Um, the MAP 21 amended transit law to require that covered agencies report facility and infrastructure condition and performance data to the NTD. This data supports requirements for transit asset management and help calculate the state of good repair related me measures. Agencies are only required to conduct and report condition assessments for transit assets for which they have direct capital responsibility. Now I get quite a few questions about direct capital responsibility, so I thought I'd go over it briefly here. This is directly pulled from our frequently asked questions on the TAM webpage, uh, www.transit.dot.gov slash TAM, and it says if you, that you have direct capital responsibility if you own the asset outright, if you own it jointly with another entity, or if you're responsible for replacing, overhauling, refurbishing, or conducting major affairs, uh, <laughs> repairs on that asset or the costs of those activities are itemized in your budget. You do not have direct capital responsibility if you don't own the asset and you're not responsible for those same items I just mentioned, replacing, overhauling, refurbishing, or conducting major repairs. So talking about it in a little more detail and con uh, considerations, an infrastructure asset uh, itemized as a capital line item in a budget does not necessarily mean you have direct capital responsibility. You must also have management or oversight responsibilities for that asset in your budget.
more details and considerations for facilities. Uh, you have capital responsibility if you own the facility, if your budget has formal capital allocation for the facility, or if you've recently paid for capital projects on the facility from your budget in the transit department or division. Now, I know all of that information about capital responsibility went, we went through pretty quickly, but again, those uh, descriptions are available on our frequently asked questions. This uh, webinar we're going over today is talking about the final guidebooks. All right, folks, I just uh, got a notice that uh, you're still having some um, audio difficulty. If you are, please download the audio help PowerPoint in the upper left-hand um, download pod. This is not a conference line. This is, only, this is a listen-only webinar. But if you have questions, please feel free to add them into the chat pod. Um, throughout the presentation, and as time permits, we'll get to it at the end. So now we're getting into uh, the webinar outright, and we're focusing on the changes from the proposed guidebooks to the final guidebooks. The presentation has the delta symbol on slides where it has changed from proposed to final. And some of the larger items are that we clarified the intended audience, we received comments that um, we should clarify that this is for NTD reporting purposes. Um, we've also uh, provided more guidance on the calculation of performance measures. And remember, these are minimum standards. So you can always go above, but this is kind of the minimum standard. We've also um, added steps to conducting and reporting a facility condition assessment, uh, clarified some condition assessment terminology, and added aggregation approach equations for infrastructure performance measure. We'll go through these in more detail as we walk through the presentation, but I just want to give you an overview. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Anne Marie Resnick to talk about the infrastructure performance measure guidebook. Hi everyone, this is Anne Marie Resnick. As Mish said, I am the PAM point of contact at Region 3 in Philadelphia. So I'm going to take you through the performance measure, uh, the performance measure reporting guidebook for infrastructure. So what we're looking for with infrastructure is a monthly average of the percentage of your track segments that are under a performance restriction. So we're going to take that monthly average and we're going to report it to NTD annually. And this is only applicable to agencies that are operating rail fixed guideway. The data requirements for your reporting are that you have fixed guideway, your number of track miles, your full service speed, and the um, reasoning behind your performance restriction. So first, to get into the definition of the fixed guideway, this guidebook de defines fixed guideway as a facility that uses and occupies a separate right-of-way or rail for exclusive use of public transportation. The key takeaways here are that this can include modes other than rail, but it does not include shoulder lanes such as bus on shoulder systems. So you can have a separated busway and, it, and fixed guideway also covers your catenary wire for trolley buses. However, only fixed guideway is being used to calculate your TAM infrastructure performance measure. The, the definition of your total track miles, this is a change from the proposed to the final. Um, total track miles it, takes, uh, it does not take directional route into account. So, for instance, in this picture, this would be one directional mile. However, we would report this as two track miles if you're traveling in both directions on this track. Full service speed, 
is defined as your plan service speed at the time that your guideway was installed. So you may have a track that can accommodate speeds up to 110 miles an hour. However, with installation, if you never intended to use that track at more than 100 miles an hour, then for your purpose, 100 miles an hour would be your full service speed. The definition of a performance restriction is this is a track segment where the maximum speed of vehicles is below your full service speed as intended at the time of your installation for that track segment. So your performance restriction will be measured at 9 a.m. local time on the first Wednesday of each month. If for some reason there is no service at 9 a.m. on the first Wednesday of the month, you would pick another time in the peak on the first Wednesday of the month to measure. So the process for calculating your performance restriction is first to catalog your total track mile. Second, you will identify any potential performance restrictions. You then review those potential performance restrictions and itemize your actual performance restrictions. So you may review your potential performance restrictions and realize some of them are not truly performance restrictions, and then they would not be included with your itemized restrictions. You then are going to calculate your performance restriction, restriction length by month, and you will use the average from each month to come up with an annual, I'm sorry, your total for each month to come up with an annual average, which you will then document and report to NTDAY. So here is an example of a list of track segments. You can see we have each section identified with a description, the from and to, which allows you to calculate your number of track miles, and the full service speed, which as we said would be at the time of installation. So here section A goes from mile zero to mile 0.1, so we have a tenth of a mile there, which has a full service speed of 10 miles per hour. The next segment, goes from 0.1 to 2.9, so that's a 2.8 mile segment, which has a full service speed of 40 miles an hour. So this is the data that will, you will use to then identify your per potential restrictions. So here we have potential restrictions. The first area has temporary speed restrictions due to rail defects. The second area is right-of-way maintenance. Third is a temporary speed restriction due to improper elevation. And the fourth is an improvement project at the station. So in this case, we are identifying all of these potential performance restrictions and collecting addition. You can collect additional data beyond the minimum requirement. That is optional, um, but that may assist you in your further identification and itemization of your restrictions. So at this point, you are going to go through your list of potential restrictions and identify which are actual restrictions. If you see here in this red box, segment A indicates that it's a temporary speed restriction due to rail defects. So the speed restriction is 10 miles per hour. However, you'll note that the full service speed in that track segment is 10 miles per hour. So this is not a true restriction. The second line, track segment B1, has a full service speed of 40 miles per hour but is currently restricted to 10 miles per hour due to rail defects. That is a restriction that needs to be itemized. Going on to the next slide, we see now this is a list of all of our true itemized restrictions. The first line, B1, is that temporary restriction due to rail defects, and then we have a few others listed as well, totaling 2.19 track miles that are under restriction for this particular month. We then take that and plug this into our table to calculate our annual average. The numbers that you see across the top of this slide are your month. So the calculations we saw in the previous slide are in month number one here, totaling 2.19 at the bottom. The 12 months of the year are then averaged together to get a year-to-date average of 3.11. This table is also broken out by the reason for each restriction, so our total average for the year of 1.08 for maintenance, 0.49 for rail defects can help you to make some more informed decisions going forward with your TAM plan. 
So there is a glossary of terms on FTA's NTD glossary that may help you navigating some of these guidebooks and rules. Um, and then there is also a sample performance restriction calculation form, which is used in all of the examples throughout the guidebook. That is all I have as far as infrastructure reporting, and now I will turn it back over to Mish and Maggie. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, and please keep your questions coming in. Uh, Maggie is answering them as she can uh, during the webinar, but we'll also take a, a, a stab at them at the end to discuss them more. So next, I am going to talk about the facility performance uh, guidebook. And, oh gosh, I wanted to remind myself of something, but uh, we have four different facility classes, administrative, maintenance, passenger, and parking, where parking is immediately adjacent to a passenger facility. But we only have two performance measures where we are combining administrative and maintenance and passenger and parking. I also wanted to provide a couple of examples. These are just really generalized examples of a facility, uh, what is considered a facility. So a park and ride lot, yes, that would be considered a facility. A guard shack, no, that would not be considered a facility. Storage structure where transit work is performed would be a yes. A standalone restroom would be a no. And then as a general rule of thumb, if your facility has less than 100 square foot of person space, it is unlikely to be considered a facility for the facility condition assessment data uh, form. In the guidebook, we added these steps to assessing and reporting facility condition and performance measures. Um, as indicated by the delta there, these steps weren't uh, itemized in the same way uh, in the proposed guidebook, but there are five steps. Uh, identify the facility type and rating levels, conduct the assessment, aggregate the results, calculate your overall performance measure, and then document and report. So step one is identify the facility type and rating level. So remember, we only have two performance measures that calculate over four types of facilities, administrative and maintenance and passenger and parking. Here we have the uh, primary rating levels or components of each of these type of facilities. On the left-hand side are the administrative and maintenance components, and on the right side are the passenger and parking, which Seeing the only differences are the equipment for admin and maintenance and fare collection for passenger and parking. Some of the subcomponents or secondary rating level examples would be if you take, for example, your substructure as your primary uh, sub uh, primary rating level. The secondary would be foundations, walls, columns, pilings, etc. If you're looking at your site component, some of the secondary uh, components would be roadways and associated signage, uh, markings, utilities, and uh, equipment, and so forth and so on. I do want to uh, mention really briefly the equipment component under uh, administrative and maintenance facilities because it um, also is an asset category um, that is collected a separate performance measure. And equipment that's valued between 10000 and 50000 can be rated as a facility, but equipment over 50000 must be rated as an equipment asset type. Your equipment a uh, component could be related to the function of your facility, including maintenance or vehicle service equipment. Um, for the condition assessments, uh, we're using the five-point term rating scale. Um, an asset is considered to be in a state of good repair if it has a rating of three or more on the term scale as identified here 
uh, five is excellent, one is poor. Um, excellent means it's basically uh, no visible defects, new or near new condition, and could still be under warranty, whereas poor would be critically damaged or in need of immediate repair and well past its useful life. So the second step in the process of conducting your condition or of uh, calculating your performance measure would be to conduct the assessment. So you would examine your component and subcomponents, determine and assign their term rating scales, and um, you can use area or percentages of area or number of units to estimate your, your, your secondary level quantities. Some of the recommendations from the final guidebook are to collect some information prior to conducting your assessment, including agency inspection and maintenance procedures and schedules, um, inspection schedule alignment with reporting schedules, data needs, warranty, and so on. This is just an example of some condition assessment tasks for the uh, component interior. Some of the specific tasks would be to include the soundness and finish of drywall partitions, interior doors, fittings, ceilings, tiles, and signage, inspect the stairs, including fire and access issues, and so forth. And that would help you to determine uh, the rating on the term scale as I identified here. A sample form is also provided in the uh, final guidebook. Again, this is an optional form. It's not a required form, but it itemizes the rating levels and the quantity of assets um, and what uh, rating, term rating, you would give to each component. So the third step would be to aggregate the results. So once the conditions of an individual facility um, are assessed and aggregated, the next step is to calculate the overall condition rating for the facility. So once you've identified which uh, component ratings, you can use one of these three approaches to determine your overall facility rating. So I'm just going to go through these briefly. There's the weighted average approach, which basically you take the sum of all of your ratings for each of the components and you multiply it by the replacement cost over the sum of all the replacement costs. So it gives you a weighted average of the cost to rating level of the components in your facility. The next approach is the median value approach, and this is a, a more mm, arithmetic, arithmetic, I don't know that word, but I think you guys know what I'm saying, approach to it. And you just take the middle value of the series of your um, sorted list of uh, component ratings. So on the upper left-hand side, you see there's the even numbered list, and you basically just take you split it in half, and then the, the, the lower number, which represents at least 50% of the rating, or you take the middle value if you have an odd-numbered list, and you just say, hey, well, um, we're just taking a, a mathematical approach, I can't say that other word, um, to determining our facility uh, condition rating based on what the um, median value is of all of the components in the facility. And then the last approach is kind of like a whatever else is out there. So it's an alter alternative weighting approach. And um, we kind of leave that up to you to determine uh, what that approach is as long as you can document it and uh, justify it and that it's repeatable um, and provides a rating on uh, the five-point term condition scale. Um, it is... Uh, potentially could fall under the alternative weighting approach. 
The fourth step is to calculate the actual performance measure. So up to this point, we've been measuring um, the parts of the facility. So we've started off with the rating levels or components and identifying them on the turn scale. Then we kind of rolled that up to the entire facility and we gave each facility its own term rating and now we have to conduct the performance measure. So the performance measure is the combination of all the facilities in that uh, category, excuse me, not category, but that, that grouping um, and then you come up with a performance measure. So we have the two groupings, admin and maintenance, passenger and parking that require performance measures and you just take um, the percentage of facilities under each class with a term rating below three. So in this example, you have two passenger facilities with a rating of four and two parking facilities with a rating of two. So um, the number of facilities with a rating below three is two. Oh gosh, this sounds so confusing. But um, there are only two facilities that are rated below um, three on the term scale. So two over the sum is 50%. So that would be your performance measure. That's not the same as your target, but that is where you would start in terms of identifying uh, where you wanted to set your targets. So we're about halfway through our time and we're at the end of our presentation. I do want to again point out that the uh, guidebooks are final and you can find them on the TAM webpage, also linked here on our presentation. And I also want to highlight again the new course that we have available, Calculating Performance Measures and Setting Targets. It is available now. Today is the very first day that it has been available. Um, it is being provided through TSI. Um, you can get to it through this webpage, www.dot.gov. TSI. And there's also registration instructions on our TAM webpage as well as downloadable from the pod in the upper left-hand corner. So I've mentioned it several times through uh, this webinar about our TAM webpage. And here is the link to that webpage. There are a lot of good uh, information resources available there. Um, this training course. Uh, that's coming out that I just mentioned through TSI is an online course and it's intended to be um, paced um, based on your abilities or sophistication um, and you can take as much time or as little time with it as you like. This webinar kind of just did a very brief overview of these uh, guidebooks not a deep dive, whereas the course goes into a, a lot more detail about both of the guidebooks and the other performance measures for the vehicle asset categories, both equipment and rolling stock. In addition, it gives um, a high-level discussion of target setting consideration. So I would encourage you to consider taking that course. In addition, um, FTA may be providing additional webinars on these topics if you feel they um, are warranted. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Maggie to um, kind of go through any of the questions that either she may have already answered and wants to bring to the attention of the audience or some questions she may not have answered um, or been able to answer yet. Okay. Thanks, Mish. All right. I'm going to go through questions Mish and I will answer as appropriate between the two of us. The first question we had is um, a need to define major repairs. Do we have a definition for major repairs in the We do not. The context of this? Okay. Um, what if you own the asset? but beneficial use has been transferred to a freight operator and they are the ones maintaining the asset. So I think I answered this in the chat pod as well, but if you own the asset, you are responsible for ensuring that a condition assessment is done for that asset if it is a facility 
or that a performance restriction calculation is done and reported to the NTD if it is um, right of way. The next question we have, we're confused regarding your definition of directional route miles versus track miles. We thought the definition was the opposite of what was on the slide. I think this has to do with the original guidebook was written um, as if the performance restriction was going to be based on directional route miles. Based on input from the industry, we adjusted that to be track miles. So you will see that change reflected in the new guidebook. Um, the performance restriction for essentially the slow zone um, metric is based on track miles and not on directional route miles. And the next question was, if a train or multiple trains are going slowly out of necessity, regardless of reason, localized, but there are, was no directive from supervision to go slowly, does that um, recorded incident qualify as a right-of-way performance restriction? No. Performance restrictions are essentially your formalized slow zones. So when you direct your operators to slow down um, in a certain area based on the condition of your track, that is what would be reportable as a slow zone if an operator sees someone, uh, you know, a trespasser running beside the track and makes the decision to slow down for safety reasons based on training or based on, you know, common sense, that would not be a recordable slow zone. That is just safe operation. Thank you. Um, is special track work, turnouts or crossovers included in total track miles or restriction miles? So all of your in-service track would be included in your performance restriction calculation. So any special um, track work that you have in service would be um, included. Out of service track, so your yards, um, any, I, I guess most turnouts probably would not be out of service necessarily, but any track that you do not use in service um, for revenue service um, would not be included in um, your performance restriction calculation. So the next question is, oftentimes we only have a restriction on one track. Um, this is very common in the industry. How should we reflect this when using track miles? So essentially track miles, if you have two parallel tracks um, that are one mile each, uh, that is two track miles. So you would say if one of those is under performance restriction, one mile of um, performance restriction. Support vehicles under 50K would be raised as equipment. I'm not quite sure what this is. Um, this was Debbie. If you want to clarify that question, we might be able to address it in a moment. Actually, I believe that there, Debbie is uh, referring to um, the non-revenue service vehicle as an equipment asset, a, an equipment category asset. So let me clarify, there is an equipment component of admin and maintenance facilities, which was provided in this webinar. There is also an equipment category, which is uh, related to non-revenue service vehicles and other um, maintenance and construction equipment over $50,000. So I hope that that, I, I don't, what was the actual question, Maggie? It was a statement. Okay, so, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay, she said correct, so it must be that you... I figured it out. You figured it out. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question, what if a piece of equipment is also part of the HVAC, and what section should it be assessed? Um, if a piece of equipment is also part of the HVAC. So I guess this is for the inventory versus the condition building condition assessment. assessment. So for the building condition assessment, essentially what we're saying is look at your major systems, um, assess those, let those inform the overall assessment of the building. In the crudest terms, that's what we're saying. Yeah. So if you have a piece of equipment that you're going to inventory separately, um, but you think it's a critical part of your HVAC system and informs the condition of your building, we're not asking you to do and report condition assessments of all of your equipment to us. It is only for the building at large. So if you think it informs the overall condition of your building, I would encourage you to include it in the HVAC system as part of you know, what informs the ultimate roll-up of your um, condition assessment for the facility. Okay, is yard track included in any of the track reporting and rating, or is it under yard facility? Yard track um, is not included in the performance restriction, so it's only your revenue service track. That would be, I said in service before, revenue service track. So um, yard track was not, would not typically be considered revenue service track for this. You wouldn't include it in your performance restriction metric. Um, there's a question, does FTA have a sample TAM plan that agencies can use? Can I toss that one to Mesh? Sure. Um, actually, no. 
We do not have a sample TAM plan, but we do have a small provider TAM plan template that um, many Tier 2 agencies have been using um, as a guide. We also have the TAM guide, which is not a template at all. It's 270-some pages, but it's a very comprehensive um, guide that walks through um, all of the considerations in a TAM plan. We don't have a template for Tier 1 simply because a Tier 1 plan is going to be so unique and uh, specific to that agency that it would probably be fairly useless to have a template. Okay. We had another question. We had a couple questions about this. When will this presentation and the one from the May 8th building and asset inventory be on the TAM webpage? Uh, I don't know what the May 8th webinar was, but I'm not sure what that one was either. But the May 23rd webinar, I am trying to get on to our webpage. Um, we're having some technical difficulties, um, and I have not been able to load it to our webpage. But hopefully, I can get that cleared this week. I've been trying to do it for a while, so I apologize for that. It will be posted, hopefully before this one, but at a minimum with this one. All right, can you please confirm that park and ride lots, commuter bus lots, for example, that are not adjacent to any passenger facility are not part of these evaluations? I cannot confirm that because if it's a park and ride, commuter ride lot, it's also a passenger facility. It's where you're picking up your passengers for the commute. Yeah. I'm making that assumption. So if it is a bus stop, then it would still be considered a passenger facility, and that parking lot would be adjacent to it. Yeah, right. If it's yeah, more than just a. If it's more than just a parking lot, if it's a parking passenger facility. Facility. Um, when do you expect to next update the asset inventory reporting module? Um, I'm assuming that this is a question about the NTD, the actual NTD asset um, reporting module. The NTD asset uh, inventory reporting module, we are actually finalizing incorporation and design into our online reporting system right now. Um, and I had a meeting this morning about it. <laughs> so we will roll it out um, when NTD reporting opens this fall. You'll be able to begin reporting the extended um, asset information into the NTD in the fall optionally. Again, it's not required until the fall of 2018 with your 2018 report, if you begin reporting at that time. Um, and it, we will allow, we are now finalizing direct upload capabilities. So you can essentially enter everything into an Excel template and then directly upload that into the NTD asset inventory. So you will see that this fall when you kick off your um, fiscal year 2017 NTD report. All right, if there's ongoing construction or a reason a station must be bypassed, does that count towards performance restriction? Not going slower, not going slower just not stopping there. So no, um, only if you actually reduce the speed to go through that construction area, then yes, that would be considered a performance restriction. If you fly through it at your normal rate <laughs> of speed and you just don't stop there, um, not a performance restriction. Um, should condition assessments of infrastructure such as peers be done in the same way as facilities? So uh, you are welcome to do a condition assessment of any of the assets that you have for your own record keeping. We do not require you to um, report condition assessments for any, like for any piece of infrastructure that is not a facility. Is that? Uh, so I think We've discussed this prior, and ferries, while they are considered fixed guideway in the NTD, are not necessarily infrastructure category assets in the TAM regulation. So, well, she's not asking about the performance she's only restriction. She's asking about the facility. Okay. All right. Well, then, yes, I agree with Maggie. It's not reportable to us. Now that the definition of facility has been changed to a single building, I no longer know where to apply the condition assessment for the site when there's more than one building, a situation that exists at um, almost all of our locations. I already programmed our database to aggregate condition ratings by entire site as a facility. 
So does this mean that this person has a compound of multiple facilities that, that they were going to do? They have a facility assessment? with multiple buildings. And they're going to do an assessment as one facility as for one. all of those multiple buildings? That is the way their data is currently set up, if I'm reading this correctly. So do you want to address that? Um, I, yes, you would have to uh, respond to each of your individual structures as an independent facility. Okay. Um, let's see. If a bus-based site has several buildings and a site, um, oh, let's see. Can the site be rated? And oh, can the site be rated as a separate facility? Um, I'm not quite sure with this question. This may be kind of similar to the previous question about several buildings on one site. A base site has several buildings and a site can be, can the site be rated as a separate facility? Yeah, Eric, you're going to have to clarify that question. It's, I'm not sure what that means. Let's go on to Margaret's just in, case, okay. in the meantime. As a state DOT, if we have a new applicant, at what point would they be included in the current state TAM plan? Uh, when their uh, facilities go into revenue service. Yep. Or, excuse me, not just their facilities, when their assets go into revenue service. Yep. So, yes. Um, our question about directional route miles versus track miles, are the examples correct on your slide 14? It seems like the picture is wrong. Uh, we may have to double check that. I don't know off the top of my head. Let us get back to you on that, Erin. Is there a bus-specific TAM webinar available? Uh, no. no. Um, is there a threshold for number of parking spaces in a park and ride? We don't no. have a threshold for a number of parking spaces. So no, but uh, oh, yeah. when you finish, I want to go back to the previous question really okay. quickly. Please, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted the person that asked about the bus only uh, webinar, I want to also um, mention to you if you're a bus only facility, if you have under 101 buses, you are a tier two operator and you could uh, potentially um, take the Tier 2 course um, or look at some of the smaller operator materials to help out um, with your bus-only considerations. Okay. Um, looking at the TAM website, last update says May 18, 2017. Are the links on this web the final rule? Yes, they're the final guidance on the guidebooks. The final rule was published a while back, and that is also available on um, the TAM webpage. Okay. The question about crossovers was referring to the diagonal tracks connecting the two parallel tracks. So, okay, so yes, for crossovers, um, if you are uh, using them in revenue service, they would be part of your revenue track. Um, also, let's see. Can you provide a link to the recorded webinars? We will be providing, um, the recorded webinar will be um, available on the TAM website. We don't have the link at this moment. We haven't posted it yet. <laughs> but um, it will be available, and you can find it on the TAM website. Um, but I think Donna also was having a difficult time downloading the webinar um, document from the download pod. Mm -hmm. um, I reposted it in that pod, hopefully. That has helped. Um, it's a much smaller, um, it's a PowerPoint version versus the PDF version, and maybe you'll be able to download it that way. Okay, let's see. As a state DOT, we did a $20,000 rep roof repair on a county owned transit facility. Would we be responsible for reporting that facility? Um, not necessarily. So if you have, uh, capital replacement responsibility for a facility, you are responsible. So essentially, if you have ownership and you are on the hook for capital replacement, um, you're, you are responsible for that facility, and the facility is used in public transportation. If you um, provide funding for $20,000 in repair for a site that's owned by someone else, and that's a funding agreement that you have um, entered into, but you do not own or have ultimate capital replacement responsibility for that facility, you're not responsible for reporting it. Uh, for the purpose of meeting MPO requirements, what do we have to provide them? So I'm going to jump in on this one. Um, 
So for the purpose of meeting the TAM requirements, when you finish your TAM plan in October 2018, you will share that with your MPO and your state planning partners. Prior to that, um, I think 180 days after the initial targets were due, um, you will have to share with them your targets. So just a written list of your asset classes and the targets that you have set for those asset classes um, and your useful life benchmark for the vehicle-based uh, performance measures is all that you are required to provide them. But this actually gives me an excellent plug into a webinar that um, our planning office is holding. Um, when are they doing that? They're doing that uh, June 20th. So I think that's two weeks on a Tuesday. And I may have put that flyer I did not put that flyer, but I was planning to put that flyer in the download pod. It's also, um, I'll go ahead and do that now, but it's also linked in our um, TAM webpage. Um, okay, what are the implications? of using FTA default useful life benchmarks, for example, 42 years for a ferry. For instance, if we maintain a ferry in a state of good repair beyond 42 years, should we ask the FTA to approve a different useful life benchmark for this and all ferries? Um, you can set the useful life benchmark for any of your uh, revenue equipment. We provide a default to help guide you in, um, for creating that. Some people were concerned with, well, what should I set as a useful life benchmark? The defaults are there to help give you a ballpark. If you intend to keep that ferry for 70 years um, and you think you can keep it in a state of good repair, then you can um, essentially enter 70 years as your useful life benchmark when you report this to the NTD. Our acceptance of your report is our approval of um, that uh, adjusted benchmark. So no, no issue with that if, if your um, operations dictate such. And if your question is more so what is the benefit, what is the drawbacks, there's some more information provided in that online course of, oh, wow, about setting useful life benchmarks and targets. So um, I would encourage you to take a look at that course. So this is a follow-up to an earlier question. The problem that's been introduced is the site itself where there are several buildings. So one site, several buildings. And Mich did, do you think we adequately address that, that each building needs a condition assessment on a site? I believe he was typing that as I said that. So okay. I hope that that has clarified it. Okay. When you mentioned bus-only facilities in Tier 2 course, what does that course consist of? Or do you happen to have a link that I can use as a resource? Yes, that link is on that TAM webpage um, that you have up in front of you um, under our outreach and training. You'll see um, the NTI description of the course. Okay. Ooh, got a really long one. Yeah, I know. I was looking at that one. I can't even read the whole thing. It's the... Give me one second. I'm going <laughs> to for you to... I can read this. Okay. We rent half of a building from our county government that houses the administration and customer service for our paratransit division. The building is about four miles away. We do not own the building or provide maintenance for it. The county government owns the building. Would, it condi would we, I guess, would we provide a condition assessment for this facility? Um, if you don't own it, you don't have any capital replacement responsibility, you are not responsible for condition assessment. Um, our downtown intermodal bus station is owned by the city and not our agency. We use the stalls to dock the buses, and we have an electronic board that lists the bus departure times. This is all our first floor of the intermodal bus station. There's a parking garage, but this is owned by the city and not the transit agency. Would the transit agency need to report this facility in the TAM plan? Uh, yes. Any passenger station, so I guess this is the caveat to that. Um, any passenger station that you use in revenue service is reportable in your inventory. Um, if you have capital replacement responsibility, you are also responsible for doing a condition assessment. If you do not have capital replacement responsibility, you are only required to report the um, the passenger facility in the inventory, basic information about it, where it is, you know, um, how large it is, and you do not have to do a condition assessment or report that to us. Um, I, you would, I think, include it in your TAM plan, yes? Yes. I also wanted to add um, or to clarify 
that this person is not a transit department within the municipality because that distinction between us and them, if you're a department within a, a county, it, it, FTA does not distinguish between a, us and a them in that scenario. You are one, in, one entity, the grantee in that situation. Um, and if that is the case, you will, I guess, have to consider if, um, the, especially for administrative buildings, if it's an inherent transit use of that facility to determine whether or not that is, quote, unquote, an administrative building. For instance, if you have an office in City Hall, we don't need you to do a facility condition assessment of City Hall um, because it's not an inherent transit use. Okay, um, hold on one more. How would you like a building that is used for both administrative and maintenance, um, also a passenger parking structure that is partitioned and also used for adjacent maintenance and administrative facilities? So uh, a building that is mixed use, I believe our guidance in the NTD reporting is that if it is for administrative and maintenance, it would be classified as a general maintenance building. Um, so you would treat it the same way as any other building when you're doing a condition assessment of it, but you would report it to us as a general maintenance. A passenger parking structure that is partitioned and also used for adjacent maintenance and administrative facilities. Um, I think you could probably do this in one of two ways. I don't think we have direct guidance for this, but my approach to this would be if you can draw a distinct line between the section that is used for passenger parking and report that as one facility and the section that is used for maintenance and administrative, um, report that as you know, administrative and maintenance, if there's a, a distinguishing line. Um, that is how I would handle that particular issue. Is it possible to utilize mileage instead of years for buses? Um, the performance measures um, for the TAM plan and for the NTD for buses and all revenue vehicles is useful life. The useful life benchmark is in years. So um, it is not reportable to us in mileage. Um, it is, must be translated into years for reporting purposes to FTA. You are, of course, welcome to use whatever metric is most useful for you in your own TAM plan as you flesh it out. But you do need to translate it into a year um, benchmark for both your TAM plan, ultimately, and reporting to us. So I just wanted to jump in really quickly. We only have eight minutes left. Yep. And I want to make sure that we get to any of the unique questions as they are. But I also wanted to go back to Randy's comment about high rail vehicles. It was just a statement. Mm -hmm. I didn't see an actual question there, and I want to invite Randy, if he's still on, to actually cl to clarify that statement um, if, if he would like. So, okay. so I think what we've received so far, we'll try and get through. We've got probably, I don't know, four or five of these. What is the webinar topic you're planning? I don't think it was mentioned. I don't know. I'm, don't know. Does that ring a bell to you? Oh, the webinars, we are having an entire webinar series that we're planning, uh, which will be several topics. We haven't finalized any topics yet, um, but the June 20th webinar is uh, based, is the MPO uh, State of Good Repair Targets Coordination, uh, which is being hosted by FTA's planning office. If we have a facility that we expanded about 20 years ago, then we remodel the old portion, how should we report this? Um, so I guess this is a facility where you have an addition that is newer than the original, and then the original is remodeled. Um, I would say for this, I mean, you're going to have to take it in its totality. So you're going to have to look at, you know, the, the total systems within, you know, where do you think that they would average out in a condition assessment. Right, and, um, and it's, it's not age-based for the facility, so um, whether they were built, expanded, remodeled, um, the age doesn't necessarily matter, it's the condition of it. Okay, uh, if we have a useful life of seven years on a non-revenue support equipment and it has reached its useful life, is it acceptable to extend its useful life one or two years at a time? Um, so <laughs> in this case, um, this will all be publicly reported. So this will all be made public on the NTD website. So I'm assuming what you're saying is we set a benchmark of seven years. Then at the seven-year mark, we decide, oh, actually, we're going to keep it for nine years. And so now I'm going to go back and retroactively change that useful life um, benchmark from seven years to nine years. So um, in reality, 
uh, you're not going to be able to go back in time. You're going to be reporting your performance metric into the future. So basically, in 2018, you're going to report your metrics for fiscal year 2019, so that then when you report your actual performance in 2019, we've captured your performance metric, you know, roughly um, eight to nine months before um, you finish out that year. So yes, you can change your metric for the next year going forward, but your actual performance for the year in which you exceeded your original seven-year um, useful life benchmark will still be reflected in the reporting system. That makes sense. I hope that is somewhat clear. That is the last, see if there's any more. There were two more. Um, Randy came back and he said he just wanted to give examples of the non-revenue equipment. Um, and they no longer know what to do with the assessment of a site when there is more than buildings since you, OK. Um, well. You want to reach out to Martin after this? Trip? Yeah. OK. Um, it, Okay. And then Amy had a question about ferries again. Does ferries need to include infrastructure assets since neither condition assessment nor performance restrictions need to be reported on them? All of your assets need to be in your TAM plan. So Mish may assert this more <laughs> strongly than I do. There is what is reportable to the FTA, which are um, condition assessments and performance restriction information and useful life benchmarks on a certain subset of assets um, that are reportable to NTD. Um, and by NTD, the FTA. But in the TAM plan that you create for compliance with the TAM program, any major pieces of infrastructure or assets that you own that fall within the guidelines of that role need to be included in your own transit asset management plan um, to be compliant with that role and with FTA guidance and guidelines. Anything to clear that, clear that up? Yeah, I just, this was part of the reason why we tightened up the intended audience for these guidebooks, because these guidebooks are intended to help users report to the NTD. This is not the extent of the TAM requirements. The TAM compliance requirements are broader than this. These are the more detailed, refined, and specific requirements to calculate performance measures so that they are standardized amongst all the NTD reporters. The TAM plan is going to be much more unique to your uh, operation and your agency. Okay. So I think Martin's question, this is, let's see if we can address this. I think we may still have to take this offline, but we no longer, we no longer know what to do with the assessment of a site. So he's asking about site as, a, as it um, applies to buildings where you have a facility with more than one building. But doesn't so, mean site meaning as grounds? Because yes. there is a site component. Yes. But how does he allocate the grounds oh. to the buildings yes. if there are eight buildings? Pick one. Okay. Um, Same with a parking facility that services multiple buildings. You pick one and you associate it as long as you consistently associate it with that uh, facility, that is acceptable. Okay. Um, let's see, we have one more and then we're going to have to work. Yeah, we got two of, minutes and, and then should we be out. a bus as an individual asset including all the components on the bus or should we report the bus and then separately report each of the asset components on the bus? Whoa, you only report the bus. <laughs> um, we do not ask you. Also, you don't do a condition assessment on a bus. You give us a useful life benchmark. You take that bus. I bought this bus this year. I plan to keep it in service for 14 years before I retire it. When you report that bus to the NTD for the first time, you say, here, I bought it this year, and I'm going to keep it for 14 years. It's useful life benchmark. It's 14 years. And then, you know, each year you sort of tell us 14 years, 14 years, 14 years. When we hit 14 years, um, you either tell us that bus went away per my plan, or I actually am keeping that bus longer. And that will affect the targets that you set for that bus's performance. Yes, well, where it falls in your target. Great. All right, I think that is our time. One minute to spare. All right. Well, thank you all 